no altar walk today. I kind of ran out of things to say. And also, we have a lot of ground to cover. So let's just jump right into it. I'm at the last section of the well. And here we go. Thankfully, we faced the single chest in the room idea before, so we know what to do. Let's open it. And because this is Jules the Oracle, we know it's not going to be filled with treasure, but with pain. Lots of pain? Well, maybe, maybe it won't be too bad. Alright, these are marbles. I can't take them off. I can't put them on top of each other. I can't put them on further atop each other. Can't move it to the next side. But I can jump over them. So if I jump over a marble, it gets rid of the one I jumped over. So if I keep going, I should get rid of all of them, or at least most of them. As long as I don't get marbles stranded in places where I can't reach them. But then again, I'm not sure what the rules of the puzzle are. Maybe, just maybe, it doesn't matter and we just have to just get rid of as many as we can. I'm overly optimistic sometimes. Let's speed this up. You have no more moves you may take. So, does that mean I win? No. No. Looks like we really do have to leave only one marble remaining. The well-planned strategy will leave but one. And right there, he pretty much confirms that we have to leave only one for this puzzle to be considered complete. One trifling maneuver may not confine your failure once committed to the Kutu of Ikakin. And right there, he confirms that he is capable of still being very oracle -y. I'm not entirely sure what he just said there. Maybe he said there's multiple solutions. In either case, we're going to require a lot more of an in-depth analysis of this puzzle in order to figure out how to solve it. Or we're going to have to get off of this board because this board doesn't even have an undo button. The second thing the Oracle said was that one trifling maneuver may not condemn you. But then again, you could be committed to failure, I think. It's hard to sometimes understand what he's saying. But the main takeaway is that there's no undo button. And for this puzzle, where we have essentially 50 moves that have to be done to reach a goal state, because there's 51 pegs and each move gets rid of one, It would be nice if we could kind of save halfway through and try certain stuff <laughs> instead of having to go all the way back there. So, to rectify the situation, I have obtained a go board. Now, in doing so, I have um, learned a few things. One, go is a complex game. And two, that's not relevant. So what I'm going to do is set up this board with uh, one color representing kind of boundaries of the puzzle and then the other color representing the pegs and then solve on the board. And there are two reasons why I want to do this. One has to do with the way I want to approach the puzzle, uh, which is symmetry. Now, in case you aren't aware, this is the shape 
of a standard peg solitaire board, or at least one of the standard peg solitaire boards. And there are some solutions for it that involve rotational symmetry. But this puzzle is nice. There's not just one peg missing, there's four. And this puzzle is nicely clean cut in the middle with symmetry. So any move I make on one side, I'm gonna mirror that on the other side. And before you wonder, can this lead to a proper solution with me? It did, I actually got two of them out of that way. By no means is this puzzle easy. In fact, one of the reasons I got this board to begin with is because many times I would get to a point about halfway through and I would want to keep revisiting that after I keep screwing up because it's not too likely that you're in an unwinnable situation already when you're only halfway through, as long as you follow some simple guidelines. But let me set this up and then we will be ready to actually look at solving this. And now we get to demonstrate the effectiveness of the go board in symmetry. That was beautiful. <laughs> well, let me actually um, undo that for a second. Oh, wait, I can actually undo. Another reason I like this. What I'm trying to do is delete pegs in such a way that I'm kind of keeping the edge pegs from getting left out. In the first playthrough I did, I had a bunch of pegs all scattered all over the place because they got left out and there was simply no way to get to them. You can't really travel with the peg because once it jumps over, if there's no space there, it has to somehow jump back. So if you have about two, two empty spaces, from a peg, it's kind of, you can't really jump there. There's just no way to do it. So if it looks like a peg's about to get stranded, we need to bring them in. So let's start with the first move. All right, what I'm gonna do is start at the corners because I don't want these guys stranded here. So I'm gonna move them inwards. And then what I can do is actually move these back there to remove two pegs at once. And that's actually called a two purge. If you go online, there's a whole bunch of information on peg solitaire. And one of the ways of, of looking at solving the puzzle is trying to package the entire puzzle in sets of, of well, packages that can then be purged using a certain shape of pegs and a certain catalyst. Now, the only real purge that I'm going to be using, or at least mentioning, is the two purge, which is basically to show that again. It, it, by the way, purges and packages are just a way of thinking, another way of thinking about solving the puzzle. That may or may not be helpful to you. It's, it's up to you whether you find it interesting or not. But the way I see it is like, this is in the shape of a, of a two purge, so I can get rid of these guys and keep this here because this jumps over and then this jumps back. So there's a lot of back and forth motion and that's why we don't want pegs to be too far away from each other because they really need to be back and forth. And we also need a, we need about equal amounts of verticality and horizontality in order for them to be able to jump around and jump back. We'll see more of that later. But the next thing I notice is I can jump this guy out and this guy out and then this leaves a hole here to so move this guy back but then this guy will be in the corner and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to invert that. Now, earlier I just said that my justification for not doing that rotational thingy in the other direction was because I did not want one of the pegs to be stuck in the corner. However, it turns out that because the other peg at the top moves out of the way and then the one at the bottom jumps back up, it really doesn't actually matter what order you do that in. In the end, you're gonna get the same result. Now, what I'm showing now happens to be the path to one of the solutions. I'm gonna to try to justify my actions for each move, but honestly, a lot of it was holistic guessing 
and once I reached certain points, I saved it. I'm going to show what I meant by saved it. And once I get here, I'm thinking, okay, this guy is in danger of getting left out, but he can easily get taken out here because there's a quite a clear two purge here. In other words, I can jump this over and jump that back over. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And then mirror that on the other side. And now what I'm going to do is I notice, like look for where there's gaps to see what you can do. Like I can do a two purge up here or I can do a two purge over here. For the time being, what I chose for the solution was over here because I was thinking at the time, I really need to get these top ones out of the way quick. Well, get them in a position where they can move out soon because otherwise they're going to get stranded up there and I'm going to have a bottom part and a top part to this puzzle. And I don't want that. I want everyone to be all together and happy because that's nice. At this point, we made some progress. We've gotten rid of actually a good number of stones. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So we're about halfway there, assuming you can get a solution from this. And it doesn't look like you can't, at least at the moment. So this is a good time to maybe save it. And this is another reason I like the go board as well. What I do, and this helped me a lot because, you know, I didn't get a solution on my first try, was to get about halfway there with a good set of starting moves and then save it to like a piece of paper. I use grid paper um, and a coordinate system. So I can easily recreate the pattern that I last had if I make a mistake and then just go back to it and try something else from there. Obviously you probably also want to when you're doing this try to remember what moves you made to get to that state. As long as you don't make too many moves, like you, you probably can remember how to get from one state to another state, or you can just write down everything. It's really up to you, but that really does help. Um, so if you screw up here, you can go back to it. Screw you, Oracle, for not offering me an undo button. But anyway, I'm thinking right now that if I could move these guys out like I originally planned. I can then move this guy up, which I need to anyway to get him out of there. And then I set up a, a nice two purge and get rid of some, some pegs. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Now I could also bring this guy up, but I'm worried that I'm gonna be breaking off and having a bunch here and a little bit here. I'm worried that that might not work out so well. Doesn't mean it won't, maybe there is a solution there, um, but it worries me, so I'm going to make a guess and say that I want to, I'd rather prefer using the top peg to start the purge process. And I'm going to do the same thing over here. Hopefully we don't have to break symmetry too soon. But we will have to eventually. And now I'm a little bit worried because there's a large verticality here and a large horizontality here. And that doesn't really work out so well when it comes to peg solitaire. So my first goal would be to think I need to poke some holes in these. Now there actually is a really nice way to do it that I eventually found and that was using this peg to jump over these and mirroring that. And what that does is it, it breaks them apart to the point where you no longer have larger strips. You have a larger strip here, but we are already set up to actually break off the edges of that. And another nice thing is obviously we should we need a move here by any for any reason anyway, so we're gonna do that anyway, because there's no other way to get those pegs out of there. 
And now I can choose to either move these two up or move these two up. I choose to move these two because diagonals, um, pegs in this, these positions, tend to work out better for solutions that I've found than having pegs all in a straight line because then you can have something jump here, jump here, and then jump over. They work better when it comes to those kinds of destroy your pegs and jump over a bunch of things and break everything. So since they work out better, I choose to make that move over the other move. And I know there's only one way to get this guy out. If I try to do something else, I'm going to break symmetry and leave him out in the cold, and there's no way to get him back. So we kind of see that this is really the only move we can make with that guy. And then we're in a really perfect position. Earlier I told you these work well with um, having a destroyer marble go around, destroyer peg go around and break them all. And that's another reason I decided to show this solution because this is beautiful. This peg here can jump here, jump here, jump here, jump here, jump here, go all the way back to the beginning and get rid of all of these guys. Beautiful. And then we're just left with this. And this can be taken out pretty easily. What we have to do is we're going to have to remove the middle marble. And then the only other marble that can jump now will be this one. Now, we, we can't, if we jump over here, we're going to be left with, you know, being stuck. We don't want to do that. So instead, we jump over here, which sets up this marble to jump back. And we can either end here or here. Middles are pretty, so I end here. And there we go. Now, that was just a demonstration of the, my favorite solution that I found. Clearly, I already knew what I was doing and what moves I was making. Obviously, when you solve this on your own, you're not going to know what moves you're making. But I did want to show, I normally don't show my notes, but I did want to quickly show the level of detail I went in at some point. It's kind of scribbly, kind of messy, and you probably can't make any of it out. But the point is, keeping a memory of things, that's the point. There are, you don't want to be in a situation where you find out that something's not going to work out and you don't remember how to get back to the last point where you started having options between do I move here or should I move this or should I move that. Get up. If you get to that point, you're going to be very, very sad. <laughs> you don't, you don't, or even worse, you might even find a solution and then not remember it. That wasn't so fun. But, yeah, that actually happened. But as long as you keep good notes, you should be fine. As I said before, about halfway, kind of write it down. But as you get towards the end, you might want to start writing down a little bit more because it, there's a very good chance when you get to an end that there's a very particular solution and you just have to find it and it requires a lot of trial and error but it's there um not always doesn't always work out if you get too frustrated you can't find anything go back to an earlier version but i am confident enough that given how this puzzle is structured um given the symmetry given the solution i found online and the two solutions i came up with um and the fact that i hit those solutions reasonably quickly, um, as in I didn't have to go all the way back to the beginning or, or made before midway to get at least one solution from a midpoint, I'm pretty confident that you won't get into a crazy unwinnable situation unless you're really, really, really unlucky. Um, I'm going to actually show another solution that I did that showed me making a different choice in the very beginning that led to a radically different board that required me breaking symmetry a lot earlier. But the point of me showing you is that there isn't just one solution to this, and there isn't just two solutions to this. And if you go online, there's another one. There are probably a good number of solutions. And with these techniques, I think you can find your own probably rather easily.
or not easily, but rather without looking for a wine bottle. It starts out rather similar to the first one. I perform this move, and I performed this move, and then I did that little rotating move thing where I kind of rotate this guy around, move this guy out of the way, and then finish the rotation. Only this time, I did two things. One, I forgot to move this guy inward, which turns out to actually have been a good choice. Um, and two, I was like, well, I've got these, this destroyer set up here where I can move these inwards. So why not do that? The original solution the, I showed used a two purge here. But what I'm going to do is instead do something like that. Now that's a slightly different, obviously, it's, but it's going to completely change how the board is and it's going to radically change the solution that I'm going to get. So what I'm going to do now is I decided, since I want to stay symmetric, I can move here and that opens up two purges here and here. And we're back at the creeper face. So from here I decide that I can move this guy out and leave some holes open. And with that, I could jump these over and remove them. One thing I do want to point out is that if you're using a Go board or using another board other than the game in the game, then it is really you really do want to mark the edges of where you can't move because otherwise you might think that hey I could do I can take this one I can move here I can move here I can move here and then there and no, no you can't do that so I'm gonna do the only move I know I can make and bring them down like that. From here, I want to get the edges, well, bring everything together. And this is a part where symmetry actually breaks. I got here, and then I did a lot of different moves from here and ended up with failures all over the place. And I was actually wondering if this would even be a viable stopping point. But then I found a solution that involves breaking the symmetry very early. And it involves the fact that I didn't move this guy up earlier. What I can do is I can instead move this guy in and then move this guy over here, setting up this little ring, and then use that destroyer peg to take out those four. And clearly this is not symmetric. And then I spent some more time with this, about, um, I would say, a good maybe 15 to 20 minutes with this. And eventually I found that there actually is a solution here. Up here, we need to get rid of these guys, but the best peg to move forward would be this one. This one's too far away. This one's too close. This one puts us in a perfect position to get rid of both, get, well, get rid of a lot of pegs. Next thing I wanted to do was um, bridge these close together. The idea being that if I move this one here, I now have a way of jumping across, but I can't really end this guy up here. There needs to be someone here. To get someone here, I can bring this guy over here. So I did that. Now you may notice I'm not thinking about the other pegs. It's because when I constantly did different versions of this, I would try out something and then because it's so small, it's easy to see if it's not going to work out because it won't work out. And then right here, I now have a destroyer peg that I can use to jump over all these, return to the original position, and this is actually rather easily solvable. I'm going to move this guy over here. 
by the way, um, when I got to this point, I definitely wrote this down, this pattern down, because there was no way I was going to screw this up. If I screwed it up, I wanted to try it again. And if you're playing the actual game and you screw it up here, you're going to be pissed off. Especially if you forgot how you got there. Move that there. Move that back. Now I can move this guy up here. Once again, I can choose where to end, and I'm going to end, once again, on the center. And there you have it. Now, what if earlier, let me reset up the puzzle as it was a little bit earlier. Give me just one moment. Here is how the puzzle was a bit earlier. Now remember what we did? What if instead of moving this guy here, you move this guy here? Well, guess what? It may not be immediately obvious, but that's a symmetric move. This is the same puzzle we just solved earlier, only flipped. Instead of moving, instead of these two being on this side, they are now on this side. And because the rest of this is symmetric, we just perform the moves backwards. It's this one that comes down to do the two purge. Now with the little three things on this side, we open up a way once again with this piece here. This does its little destroyer routine. And then we're left with the same situation we had before. Jump over that, jump over that, jump over that. And what do you know? We end up in the middle peg again. The, well, the middle of the board again. Now you may notice that those are two very different solutions. They both ended up in the middle. That's pretty lucky that they're in the middle, right? Well, kind of. But if you're moving towards the middle, you're probably going to hit here instead of any of the surrounding areas. And the reason why has to do with something called parity. Parity is essentially nothing more than oddness or evenness of a value. Small disclaimer, if you happen to be a student and you get something wrong because of something I said, that's not my problem. So, how does this help us? Let's start with what the hell I just did. I colored in a diagonal the entire board, so with three colors, yellow, blue, red, yellow, blue, red, etc, etc, leaving out the spaces which were empty. And the result of that tells me how many pegs or marbles in the starting location are on a yellow space, a blue space, and a red space. Why? <laughs> the reason why is because any move in peg solitaire involves modifying three spaces. Peg's going to move from one space to another space, which means that space is going to lose a, a peg and the other space is going to gain it. The space in the middle is now going to lose a peg. The, by coloring it with threes diagonally, it ensures that every um, horizontal and vertical set of three, which constitute part of what could be a legal move, for example, here, here, right now, but any one of these spaces, any row or column of three could at some point in the puzzle become a legal move. No matter what, it's always going to have exactly one of every color. Which means that every move is going to modify the count or the number of pegs that are in holes of that particular color. So far, this seems like a bunch of mathiness that doesn't help in any way, but it gets cool here. By counting up the number of pegs that are in all the colors at the beginning of the board, we end up with basically the parity of them. So at the very beginning, yellow is, in this color scheme I chose, yellow is 16, has 16 pegs in it, blue has 18, red has 17, so Yellow and blue start out even, red starts out odd. The cool part is that every move changes all their parity in unison. 
because either a move is going to reduce the number of pegs in that color, the peg is either moved out or it's deleted from the middle, or it's going to add to that color, as in the peg moved to the place it moved to. For example, this, is, uh, this isn't shown here because this doesn't start, a peg doesn't start here, but this is still technically blue. So we have yellow, red, and blue. If I move the yellow over, it becomes blue. Remember that. Now it's not a blue space. So yellow is reduced by one, red is reduced by one, blue is increased by one. And whether or not you add one or subtract one, you're still going to change whether a number is odd or even. So that means yellow will go down by one to be 15, red will go down by one to be 16, and blue will go up by one to be 19. So yellow and blue, so yellow goes down, blue goes up, but they both end up becoming odd instead of now even. Red then becomes even. And now we're getting to the point where I can finally show how this all relates to solving it, actually. In order for you to solve the puzzle, you have to be in a position where there's one and only one peg on the board. Mathematically speaking, with what we've set up, everything holds here, and if we want one peg to exist, where is it going to be? Can it be anywhere? Can it be on any color? Or can it only be on one color? Let's say that we expect, okay, the end goal of the puzzle will be that there will be one peg on blue. That won't work, because if, B, if blue is one, if blue is one, that means blue is currently an odd parity. However, yellow shares parity with blue, which means yellow must be odd. Yellow has to be zero for you to be in a goal state. Both yellow and red would have to be zero to be a goal state. But it can't be zero because zero is not odd. So blue ends up being one. Yellow has to be some odd number. And the lowest it can be is one. So the best you can hope for would be one peg on yellow and one peg on blue and red having nothing. Which means that the odd one out is red. If red is one, then yellow and blue must both be even, which allows them to be zero. So the way I've colored this, the positions would be the same regardless of what colors you choose. Um, I personally ended up having red as the odd one out, but it'll be the same spaces regardless. That means that the last peg can only reside in a red space. And if you noticed, we kept getting to this middle part here. And there's a reason it wasn't up here or down here or somewhere in the, like, over here. It could have been here or here. But it's because of just how the math works out. We had a point where we had two uh, pegs, one here, one here. We could have moved it over here, ended on red, or moved it over here, also ended on red. So how does this help you to solve the puzzle? doesn't. At least it didn't in my case. I just think it was kind of cool. And I guess you could kind of think of it as, well, this is a part I would be ending at. And if you're crazy enough to want to go up to pagoda functions, which I'm not even going to discuss, you probably need to know where you want your last peg to be in order to properly apply it. So that would be useful for just deciding that. And finally, if you ended up adding these, getting these parodies, and they were all the same, that means that the only way to have, yeah, you can't have just one peg because either they would all be one or they would all be zero. So that's a way of actually proving that a given board state is actually completely unsolvable. Wait. What if I colored it diagonals in the other direction. Technically, I can still do that. There's nothing stopping me. I'd have the same invariance, and I would have ended up, actually, with the same basic result. If I did yellow, blue, red going this way, I once again end up with red being the odd one out, red being the one that the peg has to end up on. So what does that mean? Because we just said that it has to end up on a red, red square. My guess, 
And then this is where I'm guessing because I'm honestly having a bit of trouble finding a definitive answer to this that isn't clouded in a bunch of difficult to understand mathematicacies. Was that when I actually did the puzzle, when I actually solved the puzzle, I had some situations where I could choose where I wanted to jump for the last peg. One situation was right here, which would be this one or this one. Another situation was right here. Uh, I don't think I actually showed that one, but um, it was either this one or this one. Another situation was up here. It was either this one or this one. So it was either this space, this space, this space, this space, or um, I'm going to guess this space. And the reason why is because it seems like the possible endings for the peg would be places that had the, um, the odd one out uh, colored parity in both ways of diagonally coloring it. So diagonally color it this way, diagonally color it this way, and the intersection of those colorings would indicate where all the, um, where you can actually have a final peg resting. So for example, this red here doesn't appear, is not, it would not be red if I colored it in the opposite direction. So it's, so I'm going to take a guess that this red space here actually can't be a final resting place for the peg. I'm going to guess that the only final resting places for the peg could be um, red spaces that are, are, are red in both colorings, starting from left, starting from um, going left to right coloring diagonally, or going right from left covering in this diagonal. I can't confirm or deny that statement, but it makes sense to me, and I felt obligated to have to bring that up because I'm sure someone was like, what if you colored it the opposite direction? Well, this is my best interpretation of what that would mean. Tasks resolved so far marked here are 18. 